everyone. This is David Parsons of the International Christian Embassy, Jerusalem. We're coming to you today from Yad Vashem, which is the world's foremost Holocaust Remembrance and Education Center here in Jerusalem. And it's Yom HaShoah, Israel's annual Holocaust Remembrance Day. And they hold it every year just after Passover to mark uh, the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto when they resisted the Nazis there in uh, the Polish capital and uh, to try and highlight not only the victims of the Holocaust but all the Jews who were heroes and rose up to resist the Nazi evil against them. We started last night, Israel holds this every year, uh, in Warsaw Ghetto Square here on the campus of Yad Vashem with uh, the official opening ceremonies. The President and the Prime Minister of Israel were both there. It's very rare where both figures show up at the same events, but this is one of those times each year where they do show up together. Uh, President Herzog gave a speech as well as Prime Minister Netanyahu. We're going to bring you those. But uh, after last night's ceremony, we come back today, and this morning we're going to have a special uh, ceremony here in the Valley of the Communities. This is a, a part, a section of the Yad Vashem campus where they honor all the Jewish communities, that uh, towns, villages that were wiped out in the Holocaust. Uh, Yad Vashem has a new book that commemorates that right now they have over 4.8 million names of Jews, individual Jews who lost. There were more than six million who perished in the Holocaust. But here in the Valley of Communities, they honor the different Jewish communities uh, uh, all around synagogues and, and Jewish life in different town cities across Europe, through Poland, Russia, Germany. They're honored here in this place. Later today, we'll go to the Hall of Remembrance and lay a wreath there in the name of the Christian Embassy, other uh, organizations who support, support Yad Vashem uh, will be there. But it's been a, a privilege of the Christian Embassy to partner with Yad Vashem for many years now to try and open up the Christian world to Yad Vashem, its education activities, helping to teach the universal lessons of the Holocaust. While we're waiting for the ceremony to start here in the Valley of the Communities of Yad Vashem, let's go back to last night when President Isaac Herzog gave his remarks at the opening, official opening of Yom HaShoah here at Yad Vashem. Uh, I know he has a, uh, in recent years as he's given this speech, he's always started out focusing on a certain photo and really telling the whole story behind it. and. Uh, I'd say, you know, it was a very sober moment in the telling of this story. And also you see in his remarks some of the plea that he's making for the nation to sort of unite, uh, get away from some of the divisions over the judicial reforms and, and unite at this time of uh, not only Yom HaShoah, but next week Israel celebrates uh, its 75th uh, Independence Day. And so the nation uh, needs that break to really come together, uh, but it starts he first here on Yom HaShoah. Let's listen to President Herzog. At this moment, a moment of majesty, mercy, and truth, we can truly hear the heartbeats of an entire nation standing before their days of awe, the week that begins tonight and will end with conclusion of the State of Israel's 75th Independence Day. But this year is no ordinary year, and this Memorial Day 
is like no other. This year, feelings are rough and shoulders are hunched, as if to attest the weight of the discord bearing down on us. I appeal to you, citizens of Israel, with a simple prayer, let us leave these sacred days which begin tonight and end on Independence Day above all dispute. Let us all come together, as always, in partnership, in grief, and in remembrance. Our beloved survivors of the Holocaust, the family members and the future generation, distinguished audience, Prime Minister, Member of Knesset, Benjamin Netanyahu and his wife, Speaker of the Knesset, Member of Knesset, Amir Ohana and his spouse, President of the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Esther Hayut and her husband, Distinguished Chief Rabbis, the 10th President of the State of Israel, Ruven Ruvi, Rivlin, Ministers and Knesset members, people from the security establishment, the intelligence and homeland security, the chairman of Yad Vashem Council, Rav Meir Lau, and the chairman of Yad Vashem, Mr. Danny Dayan, ambassadors and diplomatic representatives, our dear citizens of the state of Israel, I wish to speak to you here about just six, ten, about just ten words, a museum of skulls and skeletons of an extinct race, and that extinct race is that of the Jewish people. Zigbert Ziggy Rosenthal was exactly 40 years old when Danny, his eldest son, was born in the summer of 1939 in Berlin, in Nazi Germany. This photograph is a rare image of them together, a small, pure, and simple moment before their world was destroyed. A father carrying in his arms his son, his only son, the son he loved, a moment before he was bound by the jackboots of the devil, waving their knife and raising their hand against the boy. One can truly see, hear, feel the father's gentle face, the infant's laughter. The photograph survived, its subjects did not. In mid-March 1943, the Rosenthal family, a father, a mother, and a little boy were deported to Auschwitz. Danny and his mother, Erna, were sent straight to the gas chambers. Danny was only three years old and eight months at the time. Many stories about the Holocaust end here. This evil alone is enough to terrify anyone who has breath in his nostrils. But in Sigi Rosenthal's case, the Nazi evilness knew no bounds. It was not banal. It was infinite. Sig Ziggy was sent to forced labor. On his left forearm, the Nazis tattooed the number 107. 933. A few months later, he was taken for extermination at the Natzweiler Struthof camp on French soil. It would become the opening chapter of a horrifying monstrosity, a museum of skulls and skeletons of an extinct race. Ziggy Rosenthal, little Danny's father, was one of the 86 human Jewish victims whose organs were used for experiments by Nazi anthropologists who were looking for Jews whose skeletons, noses, ears, cranial structures, and facial features would give a voice to the race theory better than any words. Ziggy and his fellow Jews were taken, tortured, and murdered in a small and crowded gas chamber only so that their body parts could be presented in a museum of skulls and skeletons of an extinct race. The Museum of Horrors that the Nazi beast planned at the Reich Strasbourg University in France, a collection of limbs belonging to our brothers and sisters whose bodies were cut open, chopped up, and shoved into test tubes and glass bottles to be displayed and cataloged in an orderly fashion. Time after time after time, the bodies of the victims of this terrible and dark crime were violated in the camps, in the gas chambers, 
even in a medical faculty, their blood was shed like water with none to bury them. The Museum of Skulls and Skeletons of an Extinct Race reflected how with blood curdling cruelty, the Nazis were also thinking about the day after, the day when no living Jew would remain anywhere on earth. How would the enlightened world cleansed of Jews recall this extinct inferior race? How would the members of the master race and know that it had been right to expunge this untermenschen from their pure human world, this museum was supposed to provide an answer to this question. It was the finale of the final solution. The project had a commander. Professor August Hirt, a doctor, a man sworn to saving lives who horrifyingly made this collection of Jewish organs his life's work. His people performed measurements of hundreds of inmates in Auschwitz before deciding whose bodies to cut open and chop up and shove into test tubes and glass bottles for an orderly and catalog display in a collection for future visitors. 86 worlds, worlds of love, joy, and dreams reduced to dismembered limbs, and no one knows their burial place to this day, and they did not find perfect rest. This horrifying, depraved, sick act of murder for the purpose of public display exemplifies the depravity that never has such a thing happened or been, or been seen, the depths of the most chilling abyss in human history hell itself. My sisters and brothers, with human courage and divine assistance, the Allies overcame the forces of tyranny. With human courage and divine assistance, spirit triumphed. The spirit of our people who raised themselves with scarred wings from the gruesome depth of the Holocaust. It was this spirit that triumphed. The miracle of our rebirth 75 years ago was the victory of light over darkness. Darkness. We arose from dust and ashes. The yellow patch gave way to the flag of Israel. The furnaces gave way to the fires of creativity and construction. We founded an exemplary state. As is written, for the Lord will comfort his people, will redeem Jerusalem. Survivors of the Holocaust, heroes of the resurrection, with your power, your choice to live, you serve as a source of inspiration and hope. Every every day, including now. It is to you that we look up, to your love of your state and your land, to your love of your people, to your love of man. The memorial torch, the eternal flame that flickers here at Yad Vashem at the foothills of our nation's mountain of rebirth is constrained by neither time nor space. It brings with it eternity. It carries forth meaning. This pillar of fire is the light light at the end of the tunnel of the horrors of the Holocaust. It leads us, sustains us, and no less importantly, tasks us with responsibility, a momentous responsibility, above all, never to be dependent on the mercy of others, to continue sustaining and building our nation and our Jewish and democratic state by ourselves so that we may grow and prosper as the national home of the Jewish people and as a beloved humane, respectful, strong, and stable home for all citizens of Israel. Another responsibility is the task of memory, and more importantly, the task of learning from memory. We shall remember those who believed in this soul and spirit, who risked their lives to save even a single soul. We will remember and we will learn from their deeds. We shall remember what Amalek did to us, or what the Nazi villains and their accomplices did. We shall remember the horrifying human evil. And and we shall remember and we shall fight hatred, anti-Semitism, and racism in all their forms. Citizens of Israel, this year, all the more so, I wish to add something important here. The Nazi abomination was an unprecedented evil with no parallel by any metric. It is a 
It was no mere malice. It was an infinity of horror. We must remember, repeat, and internalize time and again. They and they alone were Nazis. That and that alone was the Holocaust. Even in the grips of ferocious disagreements about fate, about destiny, faith, about values, we must be careful to avoid any comparisons, any equivalences with the Holocaust or with the Nazis. At the high point of this sacred day, it seems that even the obvious must be stated. For the Nazi monster, opinions within our nation made not the slightest difference. None of the ideologies, beliefs, or ways of life, none of the differences or varieties within our people bore any meaning. For them, we were all one people, scattered and dispersed amongst other peoples, whose fate was one. Death and extinction and our victory over them, a victory that unfolds day by day, is of a single nation. We are presently marking 75 years of Israeli rebirth. 75 years of victory in which the Jewish and democratic state of Israel and Israeli society, its back straight, stand and declare before the Nazi monster and those who would follow its path, even in this generation, you will not defeat us, for sisters and brothers we are, yet, yes, brethren who know how to argue and disagree, but never haters, never enemies. We are one people, and one people we shall remain brought together, not only by a painful history, but also by our shared hope-filled future and fate. Dear Holocaust survivors, ladies and gentlemen, I began my speech tonight with the Museum of Skulls and Skeletons and with and with this I wish to end, because here too the eternal people have proven that nothing can extinguish them. Only decades after the end of the war were all the 86 victims given back their names. Warriors of memory and human dignity, absolute saints from Israel and from the nations of the world labored for many years for this end and somehow through sheer determined effort which caused ripples in France and all of Europe they succeeded. At first, they found numbers, then names. Then, the names became people with life stories, with photographs. Thus, with a 60-year delay, Hadassah, the daughter of Sarah Bomberg Berenzweig, discovered what fate befell her mother in the Holocaust. Her mother, Sarah, had placed her in an orphanage in Belgium before she was banished to Auschwitz. When they were separated, she promised her that one day they would meet again. Sarah was unable to keep her promise. She was taken and murdered among the victims of the museums of skulls and skeletons of an extinct race. Her daughter, Hadassah Bomberg, made Aliyah to Israel at the end of the Second World War. She got married and settled in the Moshav of Nir Galim. She named her eldest daughter after her mother, who was murdered with the victims of that ghastly museum, Sarah. I spoke this week with Sarah Pastel Bell, Sarah's granddaughter, who is here tonight with her family. This is the most decisive answer to any one who would call us an extinct race. Sarah and her family are the embodiment of victory and hope, the victory of a nation who once more merited their land after 2,000 years of exile, a nation who arose from the lowest, most terrible rungs of hell towards rebirth as a state, a nation blessed with momentous powers of creativity, working in pursuit of tikkun olam, healing a fractured world as part of the family of nations, a nation who as long as it still breathes will continue to will continue marching forth and proclaiming, Hineni, we are here, still we live, Am Israel Chai, the people of Israel live. May the memories of our brothers and sisters, victims of the terrible Holocaust, be preserved and bound in our nation's heart from generation to generation forevermore. We also heard from Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu last night at the official opening of Yom HaShoah ceremonies here at Yad Vashem. 
Uh, he not only focused on the Holocaust, but also the threat of a, a nuclear genocide, another Holocaust uh, emanating from Iran, and said Israel is going to unite and stand up against this. And uh, let's listen to his remarks. Distinguished audience, President of the State of Israel and his wife, Speaker of the Knesset and his spouse, President of the Supreme Court and her spouse, Ministers, Knesset members, heads of the security establishment organizations, ambassadors, chief rabbis, Distinguished audience, one and all, and first and foremost, our beloved Holocaust survivors and their families. Benjamin Zeev Wurzberger was born in Hungary. His entire family was extinct in the Holocaust, was killed in the Holocaust. He was sent to different concentration camps at the Matthausen camp in Austria. The SS officer would wake him and the other prisoners up every day with terrible screams and shouts, you dream of Jerusalem? The officer would yell at them, you will never get to see Jerusalem. You will see Jerusalem only through the chimneys of the furnaces. But Benjamin Zeev Wurzberger refused to give up on his dream. With utmost forces, he survived the Holocaust, made Aliyah to Israel, and started a very large family in the town of Afula. But he never forgot Jerusalem, not for one minute. At an older age, he chose to start working at the Kotel, the Western Wall. For him, that was the greatest victory over the Nazis, the best proof that Am Israel Chai, every day he worked at the Kotel and he would clean up these stones. He felt this tremendous turn in the history of our people from Holocaust to rebirth, to resurrection. And all his friends and family members always say there was never a happier person than him. Benjamin Zeev passed away a year and a half ago at the age of 95 years old, but his, great, but his grandchildren and great-grandchildren are here with us this evening. This chain of generations of survivors and their presence at this sacred site is a true symbol of our victory, our triumph over our enemies. And as we've just heard from the president, obviously this victory cannot efface, cannot delete the magnitude of the tragedy of our people in the Holocaust, entire communities which perished. Millions of our brothers and sisters were massacred in terrible deaths. And in addition to them, millions of people from other nations were murdered as well. The values of morality were trampled on. Human image was degraded to the ground. The scars of pain, these scars of pain will remain with us forever. And despite all that, we must always remember the unique triumph, the unique victory of the Jewish people. And I would like to, first of all, speak to all of you Holocaust survivors. It is discovered in the glorious, vast families that you started, and in your immense spirit, in the height of these atrocities, and even and also afterwards, you chose life. You believed in good. You helped others. 
You always gave, you always had chesed. And this triumph is also expressed in the straight backs of the people participating in the March of the Living. And it has expanded in Ladino-speaking ca countries such as Greece, Bulgaria, North Macedonia, and the descendants of the Jewish communities in North Africa, which were also killed by the Nazis. But the height of that victory, the height of this victory is the independence of our 75 years old country. Israel is a vibrant, free, democratic country with so many achievements, a country that all of us together are building it generation after generation. Yesterday, as I do every year, I met at the cabinet room of the Israeli government with Holocaust survivors, those who will light the torches of heroism, Shoshana Weiss, Tova Gottstein, Ben Zion Reich, Judith Solberg, Reuven Bonfil, Yafim Gimmelstein, and Malka Rendel. Malka's brother, Rabbi Ephraim Moll was also present at this meeting. He approached me after everybody finished speaking, and he was very emotional. Very, very emotional. But unfortunately, immediately after that session, he suffered from a severe stroke, and we all pray for his health. I heard with great excitement the amazing story of these courageous survivors after the terrible dark chapters of the beginning of their lives. Chapters filled with light came later on. There is no other country in the world in which its sons and daughters would have succeeded to rise from the ashes of extermination and to rise high to the peaks of resurrection Despite its great challenges, Israel is an international rising power. Other countries admire it, and I keep hearing this in every meeting I have with leaders from all over the world, including when I meet with leaders from Arab countries with which we have groundbreaking historic peace accords, and leaders of other countries with whom we intend to have peace accords. The meaning and significance of peace, it is manifest in so many ways all year long, including on this day in which Muslim children from Dubai are learning about the Holocaust of the Jewish people. A few weeks ago, I met in Germany Chancellor Scholz. We had a very difficult visit to Platform 17 at the outskirts of Berlin, where tens of thousands of Jews were deported to their death. The very last transport left on April of 1945, just a mere few weeks before the surrender of the Nazis. Still, this terrible regime insisted on killing off the very last of the Jews. There on that platform of death, I played, I gave a very clear message to the can Chancellor of Germany. Eight decades ago, as we uh, departed into the abyss of helplessness, the Jewish state was reborn. And albeit the world has changed since then, but people still call to exterminate us. And today we hear these calls from the uh, terrible regime in Iran. The basic lesson we learned from the Holocaust is that we must stop the forces of evil as early as possible. The state of the Jewish people must guarantee it has the power to defend itself on its own, facing any enemy and any threat. This evening here at Yad Vashem, I wish to add, the victory of the past does not guarantee on its own the victor, any victory in the future. Victory in the future means that we must fight 
a relentless battle against those who seek to kill us. This is why we adamantly insist that in any nuclear uh, agreement with Iran, we must not allow it to reach any nuclear weapon capabilities. And this is why we fight against its terrorist proxies around us. Those who wish to strangle us with this ring of terrorism will encounter our decisive response. Our enemies will find us standing together, shoulder to shoulder. Once again, they will discover the immense forces that our people have. My dear friends, citizens of the State of Israel, I has, have stood here many, many times over the years. And I would like to declare, as the whole world hears us, never again in this time I wish to emphasize those who see, seek to kill us, perhaps they think that we do not have the determination and the internal cohesion to face them, but they are mistaken, big time. We shall defend ourselves and together we will thwart any threat on our existence. 80 years ago, at the burning ghetto of Warsaw, the young Jewish rebellions had faced the Nazis who were equipped with little weapons, few facing the many, the many, and as they fought the SS soldiers in the bunkers beneath, in the sewage tunnels, they hoisted the flag of Zion on the rooftops of the ghetto. The leaders of these rebels asked a young man and a young woman to climb up to the roof. And they said to them, you are about to make history. You are going to hoist the flag of the first Jewish rebellion after almost 2,000 years. The two climbed to the roof as they were carrying Molotov cocktail, cocktails and guns. And as they reached the rooftop, they fastened the mass to the chimney. And the wind opened up this blue and white flag over the rooftops of Warsaw to the great excitement, uh, and their excitement and pride knew no, knew no limits. This act of heroism was a miracle that was raised high. The spirit of the rebels in the Warsaw Ghetto stood fast, but still there was an ideological abyss between them, between Mordechai Anilevich and Pavel Frankl, an ideological abyss that prevented them from uniting even at the very last moments, at the most difficult moments. The story that is filled with both pride and pain and glory of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising attest to the extent of heroism that is part of our people and it compels us to adopt this decree of the generations, spirit, power, and internal unity. This is the only way we will triumph over those who seek to destroy us. Spirit. This is the only way, in internal cohesion, this is the only way we will guarantee our spirit, power, spirit, and internal cohesion. These are exactly the elements expressed just a few days ago by Rabbi Leodi from Efrat. At the most terrible moment of his life, in the funerals of his wife Lucy and his daughters, Maya and Rina, Leo called out the eternal call that was also the essence of the life of Benjamin Zeev Wertzberger, that call that connects and brings all of us together. Am Israel Chai and Netzach Israel Lo Yeshaker. May the sacred memory of the six million of our brothers and sisters who were killed in the terrible Holocaust be eternally etched in the hearts of our nation for all generations to come. 
May God avenge their lives. Hashem ikom damam. Welcome back to the Valley of Communities here at Yad Vashem, where the ceremony is taking place uh, uh, under the International Relations Division. And uh, Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day, is very unique in Israel in that there's no entertainment on TV, there's no restaurants, you can't go dancing, there's no movie theaters open. And another unique thing about it is at 10 o'clock in the morning, there's a two minute siren where the whole nation stops, stands in attention and remember the Jews who died in the Holocaust. Even if you're driving on the highways, people stop and get out of their car and stand. We're gonna have the siren in just a minute uh, coming to you again from Yad Vashem here in Jerusalem. <laughs> We've come up from the Valley of Communities here at Yad Vashem into Warsaw Ghetto Square. This is where the ceremonies officially kicked off last night with the speeches by the President, the Prime Minister. We heard the stories of six candle lighters lighting uh, candles, Holocaust survivors, to, uh, to commemorate the six million who died in the Holocaust. The President and Prime Minister of Israel will come back here to Yad Vashem today for a, another special ceremony in the Hall of Remembrance to lay wreaths there. Uh, and so let's go there next. We've now made our way to the Hall of Remembrance here at Yad Vashem. Uh, this is a very important place. They have an eternal flame here, and on the floor of uh, this building are the names of uh, quite a few of the death camps, the Nazi death camps where Jews were gassed and exterminated and incinerated. And uh, it's a very solemn place. Uh, in just a, a little while, the President and Prime Minister and other dignitaries will come and lay wreaths here, the Christian Embassy, and uh, on behalf of all our Christian friends and supporters wor worldwide, we'll be laying a wreath because we've had a unique partnership, a special partnership with Yad Vashem for many years now. Uh, they've allowed us to come into this, uh, the Hall of Remembrance many times. זר מדינת ישראל אתכבד להזמין את נשיא מדינת ישראל מר יצחק הרצוג זר ממשלת ישראל, התכבד להזמין את ראש ממשלת ישראל מר בנימין נתניהו. כל עוד בלבב פנימה נפש יהודי הומייה ולפתי מזרח Sophia, <laughs> 
שנות Before we end our coverage of Yom HaShoah today here at Yad Vashem, uh, we recently had a meeting with Eli Cohen, the foreign minister of Israel, who had learned about our work with Holocaust survivors. Besides <coughs> commemorating the Holocaust, working to educate uh, Christians and others about the Holocaust to fight anti-Semitism, we also help Holocaust survivors. And uh, we had a nice meeting with Foreign Minister Eli Cohen, and he wants to give a greeting to Christians out there who support our work. I'm very glad to host here in Jerusalem, the capital of the state of Israel, in my foreign ministry, the Christian Embassy in Israel, and my good and close friend, Shimon Saban. I want to thank this opportunity and to thank you for all your efforts and friendship with Israel and all your support for the Holocaust survivor. And uh, I want once again to emphasize how much is important in this uh, relation and I'm sure we will continue to do uh, our best and thank you for all the one who donate for this uh, important uh, event and organization. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this special report on Yom HaShoah, Israel's annual Holocaust Remembrance Day. We hope you've enjoyed it. We hope you've learned something, giving you a taste of uh, how it's commemorated here in Israel and in, at Yad Vashem. And we just want to encourage you to take time to learn more about the Holocaust, how you can uh, help fight anti-Semitism today, stand with Israel. And we just want to bless you from Jerusalem on Yom HaShoah. David Parsons coming to you from Yad Vashem.